Okay, good afternoon, everyone. I'm Sally Hubbard, and I'm a senior editor at the Capital Forum. Um, I lead up the reporting on digital platforms for the Capital Forum, so I want to invite anyone in the audience that has views on these issues, reach out to me. I'm always happy to talk about them. Okay, so this panel today is about big data and antitrust, and I have here with me today Catherine Tucker, Catherine is the Sloan Distinguished Professor of Management Science and Professor of Marketing at MIT Sloan. Next to her is Alan Grunis. Alan is the co-founder of the Concurrence Group, and he formerly served in the DOJ Antitrust Division. He's also the co-author of a book called Big Data and Competition Policy. There it is. And last, we have John Newman. John is an assistant professor of law at the University of Memphis, and he also has experience the DOJ antitrust division. So the way that we're going to, the format of this panel is we're going to have each panelist give a short presentation, like three to five minutes, and then we're going to have the other two panelists immediately respond and give their thoughts on that, the material presented. Um, and then at the end, we're going to open it up for Q&A. So we're hoping to have a lively, dynamic discussion. First up is Catherine Tucker. OK. Well, it is utterly wonderful to be here today. Thank you to the organizers for inviting me. I have two things I want to talk about today. Uh, and they're going to be a framework for thinking about competitive advantage in big data. And then I'm going to have a few thoughts, and I'm going to tell you about a research study we've done about thinking about prices in worlds of big data, where the price is your personal data. Now, this, uh, the, the first study I wanted to talk to you about is actually based on this curious observation that we have antitrust, and then we have the world of business schools. And what's amazing is in business schools, all we ever do is really talk to our students about how to think of a competitive advantage. And in particular, we give them lots of frameworks about how they can actually protect themselves from the competition. And if you think about it, that's oddly the flip side of antitrust. But for some reason, these worlds never really talk to each other. And anyway, the reason this is going to be relevant is that recently, uh, myself and my co-author, Anja Lambrecht, we were asked by the uh, CCIA which is the Computer and Communications Industry Association, to write a report about big data as a source of competitive advantage. Now, I can't tell you how delighted we were to do this. Why? Well, first of all, I should say that CCIA, why did they want to do this? Well, basically, they represent all the tech companies that the EU would like to regulate on the basis of big data. So that was their motivation. But we were really excited to do this simply because we actually have this framework, and this is what we teach. So it was really straightforward, um, and usually for one of these sort of tasks. Anyway, the framework that we teach um, when we talk to our students, and basically we use it to sort of humiliate or eviscerate or embarrass our students by pointing out that what they thought of as competitive advantage really isn't, basically gives you four big criteria that you go through to try and think, well, is something a source of competitive advantage? Now, let me go through them just quickly now. What are they? They're rare. Um, now, this is really interesting when you apply it to big data. Why? Well, one of the unusual properties of big data is simply that because uh, of this idea of a digital footprint, that basically data gets recorded uh, very, very easily and sort of tangentially in your movements across the internet. A lot of people have access to big data. And one of my favorite new examples of this is when you think about location data, is, uh, you know, is it really rare, for example, to have that kind of data? No. And my big, my big sort of counter example is Pokemon Go. Just appeared out of nowhere. Now, lots of location data. It shows that this sort of data can spring from everywhere simply because we leave this digital footprint every time we navigate the internet. The next question then, of course, is whether big data is inimitable, which is the second of the criteria we use. And the idea here is just if I came in, could I imitate what you've done in terms of amassing big data? Now, when we look into this, well, of course, we all have the world of data brokers. We may or may not like them from a policy perspective, but data brokers exist precisely to ensure that big data is not inevitable in, uh, and instead something that it's easy for um, people to potentially buy. Um, and again, I think this comes from the property, if we go back to economics, of digital data being ultimately non-rival, meaning it's easy to sell again and again. <laughs> 
The third criteria is probably our favorite because then we got to rant on actually about our research. And the third criteria is whether or not big data can be thought of as a valuable resource. And the reason we got excited about that is we've done so many studies where we show that advertisers or firms trying to reach consumers that have loads and loads of big data make systematic mistakes because they fail to actually process or interpret this big data in the right way. And what we emphasize that's really important, more so than big data, is often uh, digital experimentation and having the right engineers in place who can actually build smart algorithms. The last thing we think about when it comes to this sort of criteria, the fourth one, is is it non-substitutable when it comes to a source of competitive advantage? And the idea here is, okay, you don't have it, but can you use something else as a substitute to enter into the industry? And at this point, we talk about all the examples um, which have happened at you know, all these platforms. In fact, they were discussed in the previous panel, which have come out in some ways of nowhere, such as Uber, Airbnb, even Candy Crush makes it. Basically, all examples, incredibly successful products or platforms, but which emerged in industries, even though incumbents arguably had far more data. So this is the basic paper. We just go through these four steps, really just emulating what we teach in, uh, you know, in, in the classroom. Now, I think, of course, you could say, OK, so you set this up. But isn't it the case that when you use this kind of framework, well, could anything, anywhere, could big data ever be a competitive advantage? Haven't you really managed to exclude that possibility somewhat? And I've been thinking a lot about this challenge, because I I, what I want this paper to be is to be useful for thinking about big data rather than just a one-sided argument. And so I was thinking about it, and I think, yes, yeah, sometimes using these criteria, big data can be a source of competitive advantage, perhaps barriers to entries if we uh, talk about, anti if we use antitrust language. And, you know, but then you'd be looking for me at circumstances such as firms that amass uh, genomic data or something like that. Why? Well, there is an example, it's an area I've been working on recently, where it's actually very difficult to replicate the advantages of having a lot of this kind of data. Why? Well, there's so many privacy protections in place, it makes it hard to quickly amass that kind of data. Okay, so I wanted to go quickly through that. This paper's linked to on the internet. You're welcome to read it. It's actually you know, quite a quick read uh, for a law-related article. The next thing I wanted to move on to, and this is really anticipating some of my panel, co-panelists' comments, is going to be uh, a little bit about thinking about antitrust and big data, where the argument becomes, OK, often there's not a price when we think about platforms that rely on big data. Instead, often consumers, are their data is used by advertisers to uh, improve the effectiveness of advertising. Of course, the advertisers themselves pay a price, let's be clear, it's not that there's no price in these platforms often, but sometimes there's this exchange where consumers are using their, da their data is used to improve the effectiveness of advertising. Now, this brings us to sort of idea about whether or not privacy itself should be a matter for antitrust. This is a huge debate. I've been to many conferences where that's all we've talked about. All I wanted to offer, really, was my most recent study that we've done at MIT. And I'm just really fascinated by the study, which is where I'm mentioning it. And it goes to the question of, well, how can we even think about a model of a world where, rather than using price, we're using privacy? Anyway, this study was part of the MIT digital currency experiment, where we give, gave every single MIT undergraduate uh, $100 in Bitcoin. That's actually irrelevant. That's just why we ended up doing this. But as part of this experiment, what we did was we asked the MIT undergraduates for their contact details. In fact, we asked them for their five friends' email addresses. Now, when we did this, we hadn't really thought it through, but we later discovered that asking for a friend's email address is basically one of the most privacy transgressive things you can ever do. Uh, it's sort of second to asking for a social security number if you ask people about really sensitive private information. So we, we actually transgressed. We hadn't really thought about it. And, uh, and let me tell you, the MIT undergraduates let us know we transgressed. In fact, when we asked them for these email addresses of their friends, they supplied false email addresses. And let's be clear, they put enough expletives into those false email addresses to make it clear that they were very, shall we say, angry with us. Um, OK, so that was what we did. But where's the privacy point here? Well, the privacy point is that was half the undergraduate population. 
In the other half, there was a slightly difference to the randomization in that we offered them pizza. Uh, that's right, they got pizza if they gave us the email addresses of these five friends. And what we found was as soon as we offered them pizza, uh, they started uh, giving us their friends' email addresses completely. And what's more, it wasn't what we, the biggest change was actually among the population of people who said they really cared about privacy. The people who really cared about privacy when we didn't give them pizza, the ones who were really swearing at us, as soon as we offered them pizza, everyone gave up their email addresses. Now, or their friends' email addresses. Now, there are two ways of thinking about this, I guess, from a perspective. As an economist, I'm like, my own reaction is, gosh, preferences over prices we see are very unstable. And it's really hard to think of actually putting them into a model when we have stated preference which diverge so profoundly from how we see people actually behave in terms of being willing to exchange their data for, their, uh, for, for, for services. On the other hand, you could hear the study and think, oh my gosh, people really need to be protected. Uh, if MIT undergraduates who, you know, who we assume are going to understand everything about technology are willing to give up their data in exchange for privacy, we really, really need intervention. So I just want to share that anecdote, and I look forward to hearing from the rest of the panel. Thank you. Okay, so uh, let me ask Alan first off. Do you have any thoughts on the implications of Catherine's research? Well, I'll, I'll save um, uh, sort of the, the bigger paper that you introduced um, first, Catherine, for, for my comments. Um, but I, I do want to respond to the, to the, the issue of teaching business students to seek a, a sustainable competitive advantage. Um, and you came up with a number of problems, I guess, in the online world to achieving that, and that's, that's what your paper was about. So a couple of years ago, I finally got around to reading um, some other business school professor's <laughs> book um, on this topic, um, Hal Varian and Carl Shapiro. Um, their book, Information Rules, which was written, I guess, when Hal was at Stanford and Carl was at UC and had just come back from DOJ. And what struck me in, in reading that book was that they said um, lock-in and switching costs are ubiquitous in online markets. In other words, there's a real element of stickiness. And the book as a whole, you know, you could almost subtitle it, How to Build and Sustain a Competitive Advantage in the Online World. So I, I just offer that as kind of the, 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 the counter -argu academic argument. Um, in terms of uh, the experiment, I think, you know, I, always, I, I find your work always interesting. And, and it's, you, you know, it's kind of like, what, what do we get out of this? What do we get out of the fact that people don't want to give away their friends' um, email information, but they're willing to give it away for what seems like a pretty low price, um, although, you know, pizza in college I, maybe is very highly valued, I don't know. But, you know, the, 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 the mystery to me in, in this, or the question that it raises is, um, what if you ask the question a little bit differently? What if you framed it a little bit differently? Um, as opposed to just say, you know, give us the information, what if you said what you were going to do with it? Um, and so, for example, what if you said, give us, give us this, give us this private information of your friends, and uh, we will, um, because we, we're very good technologically at MIT, um, we'll get into their Facebook pages, uh, we'll go through some of the history that they've deleted, and we'll put, put in um, interesting things about their past relationships. Um, you know, the, the point here is that I think it's hard to talk just from an economic standpoint about, you know, people behave as if they don't care about privacy because the, the issue that's lurking just below the surface is do people really know what they're giving up and what's being done with it? John, do you have any thoughts on these topics? Uh, well, like Alan, I'll try to save some of these for later on, but 
I would respond just to the point about whether information or big data is valuable, right? And we've suggested uh, more than the data itself, it's having the right engineers in place to manipulate the data, to use it. Uh, I'll suggest we think about this from the perspective of Stuart Brand, who had the famous quote, right, information wants to be free. What's the other half of that? On the other hand, it wants to be expensive. Why? Because it's so valuable. Uh, and if you look at the actual behavior of firms who are in possession of big data, I think certain types of big data, not so valuable, right? So you suggested uh, geolocation data. It's pretty widely available. It doesn't cost that much to acquire. But I think the kinds of things that this discussion today has been more concerned about with, those types of information data can be very valuable. So how does a consumer react when faced with a list of search results? may be provided by Google, chances are. That information is pretty valuable and it's not easily acquirable. Unless you're Google, you don't have access to that bit of data. So I'd push back on that point uh, a little bit. So I have a couple questions um, for, for Catherine myself. I mean, I guess the idea of data not being valuable, if you look at some of the, the purchase prices, right, like Facebook bought WhatsApp for $18 billion. Do you think the data was not a big part of that? Or do you think they were mostly paying for network effects? I mean, how do we explain some of these really large purchase prices for companies that if it's so easy to start up again and start your own without the data advantage, why pay 18 billion for WhatsApp? Okay. So many wonderful comments. Thank you. I'll go to uh, Sally, first of all, just because she just said it. WhatsApp, oh my gosh, let me tell you, as an MBA teacher, that is just one of the bugbears in my life. And the reason is, is it gives all my students an excuse to basically have a plan to make no money whatsoever, not have a business model. And they say, we're going to get acquired by Facebook. Um, so it's a bugbear. But the way I always view it is it's not about the data. You know, Facebook's got better data. Instead, it's about Facebook's paranoia. I mean, Facebook, oh my gosh, if I was in the social networking industry, I would be incredibly paranoid. We had Friendster, replaced by MySpace. MySpace was displaced in a matter of months. So I always think of WhatsApp as a, sort of a emblematic of Facebook's paranoia. And you know, what I tell my students is, yes, you may get paid that much money for something if you manage to make a big tech company that paranoid. But that's my sort of viewpoint on that. Um, now let's, uh, also oh, some wonderful questions here. Stickiness, I'm so glad you bring that up. Let me, I'll just tell you what I teach, or at least say to these MBA students when, when they sort of bring up the big data and stickiness argument. Um, what I always say is, you know, you can have big data, but it doesn't necessarily lead to lock-in. What leads to lock-in is if you have the algorithms in place, which allow better recommendations, and for your users to potentially have a better experience every time, every month, or every time they use your product. And so I think there's a little layer on top of the big data, uh, and it has to do with how you can use algorithms on it to make users' life better. Um, now, in terms of value, I think I don't want the criteria I laid out to say that big data can never be valuable. What I'd like us to do, though, is to sort of go through, rather than just saying all big data is valuable, potentially use this as a framework to say, what kind of data do we worry about? Um, I also had a question based on your article when you were talking about, you know, does big data create a sustainable competitive advantage? And some of the examples that you gave, like, you know, look, there was Match.com and then Tinder came along, it didn't have the data. Um, in my view, Tinder is very different than Match.com. <laughs> yes. um, so, what I wonder is, you know, do you see differences around the margins? Like Pokemon Go, I'm a Pokemon Go expert, I must disclaim. Um, there was nothing out there like Pokemon Go, so it's not like it toppled an incumbent that had more data. So do you have examples where there was an incumbent that had more data and a new company that came along that was much more similar that was able to challenge? I mean, the MySpace thing, that was a long time ago yeah. now. Yeah, okay, so I mean, I... So first of all, let's be clear, as a marketing professor, it just makes my heart sing out with joy. An example like Tinder, where you enter a market because you identify an underserved segment and do a really good job of them. So I don't want to dismiss that, because that's what we love. Um, 
But if you want serving the same target market again and again, I think a really good example for me is something like VRBO. Um, and even, dare I say it, TripAdvisor, which is a Massachusetts company, you know, they had links, they had data about people who were listing apartments, who had houses or space they wanted to sell. You know, they had that all in place, you know, both great companies, but Airbnb came in and was able to, I think, take that market away from them. So I think there are examples out there. Um, so Alan, did you want to go next? Or? Sure, I, I'll, okay. I'll, so, so I just want to add another, another facet, which I think can get overlooked. If, if we had slides, I was going to put up um, a slide of an aluminum smelter um, in Oregon um, and remind people that um, the process of smelting aluminum was invented or discovered in 1896 by somebody named Hall. He did the Hall process, which involved nasty chemicals and a lot of electricity. And, but it rapidly got uh, scaled up, industrialized, um, and uh, turned into what was later became the Aluminum Company of America, or, or Alcoa. I mean, the, the experiment was done in the woodshed behind his house. Okay, the initial experiment. You know, if you think about it, all this sounds a little bit like the origins of Google, right? And so the, the second slide that I was going to show, and this, I mean, to me, this, it's fascinating. To, to do a big aluminum smelter, you need a lot of power, access to a lot of power. So they, they typically get cited where power is plentiful and cheap. So Google built its first billion dollar data center, actually, on the site of the aluminum of one of the aluminum smelters, um, right about the time it was being decommissioned, and I think what we one thing that gets dropped is the infrastructure <coughs> component here. Um, and you know, just to quote a little bit from a GigaOM article in 2007, which said Google's in the, the title of the article was Google's infrastructure is its strategic advantage. Okay, the importance of speed, the importance of s scaling up. And, and the, you know, I won't go through the article, but the summary in it was, to sum up, Google's gi gigantic infrastructure is the big barrier to entry for its rivals and will remain so as long as the company keeps spending billions on it. So, you know, that's, that's another component that in these markets I think we forget about. Um, I, I don't, you know, I don't want to kind of get cute and, and, you know, remind people as I always do, Jeff, um, about Peter Norvig's alleged comment, you know, in 2010, um, where, where he apparently, Google's chief scientist apparently said, we don't have better algorithms than anyone else, we just have more data. Um, now, having not made that comment, though, there is an, a CNET piece which does quote <laughs> that um, <laughs> in 2010, uh, where they had an internet guru who basically said, um, the whole web is the operating system of the future. And um, the, his conclusion, uh, somebody named O'Reilly, was the lock-in of today is through massive databases that are so hard to recreate because they get better the more people use them. I just, okay. you just unfortunately reminded me of another research paper. And this one is where we actually looked at what happened to Google. And I'm going to take, you know, whether or not the chief scientist said this, we actually looked at this in Europe. And what we did as a, uh, a few years ago, the European Commission got really edgy about Google's uh, big data as a sort of advantage. And they said, look, we want you to stop storing your data logs in identifiable form for so long. Well, basically, they said that to all search engines. Um, only Microsoft and Yahoo took any notice. And anyway, Microsoft and uh, Yahoo took notice, and they actually reduced how long they were keeping their, their search engine data for. And we went to see, well, how did this affect anything? And this paper's never been published, and the reason it's never been published is we couldn't find any evidence of anything. Taking going from 18 months of data to six months of data didn't seem to change anything about search engine behavior. And when we asked folks, uh, admittedly at Microsoft and Google about it, they said, well, that's because ultimately so much of your data is not that useful because it's all about speed. 
and about dealing well with unique predictions. So I'll just say that. It's not conclusive. But that's and no one's ever published it, but it is out there. Can I just say on, uh, clarify on that? So it's talking about historical data, but oh, no. it's not talking about the vastness of the data that they have in the short term. So no, that no. could still be the advantage. You're just talking oh, about historical. Definitely. Okay. I'm just saying, you, but you cut the data by... Right. by but still, like at percent, any one saying, moment in time, yeah. the amount of data that Google has from like a week ago is probably, you know, dwarfs anyone else. That is out undoubtedly there. true. Okay. <laughs> but it was just amazing to find absolutely nothing. So can we all can we all have the right to be forgotten? I like that. Well, I think Sally, that's a really uh, important point. This idea of data decay is out there, uh, and I think it's accurate. If you talk to search engine folks, kind of off the record, they'll say, "Yeah, most of our data is worthless after 10, 11, 12 weeks." Uh, so people often talk about data as a competitive moat. I don't think that's the right way to think about it. Right? It's not like there's a moat that gets bigger and bigger and bigger the longer that someone like Google seems to have a dominant position. I don't want to get into that fight again. Uh, the better way to think about it, though, is, is that Google has something like a big fire hose that they're able to drink out of and nobody else is. So I think that's the kind of the way to think about these. I'm not sure it solves the debate uh, to say that data decays very rapidly. Um, but I think we can think about it in a more helpful way in this, this framework. So before we start running out of time, I'd like to have our next panelist speak. Okay, it's going to be Alan who will be speaking next. Okay, so I don't, I don't have my slides, but everybody now knows what they would have been. I mean, they, looking at the two uh, plants, they almost look identical, and you know, I tried to find one with Mount Rainier or whatever it is in the background, you know, so you could see it. From, what is it? Hood. Sorry, sorry, Jeff. I I'm not a Pacific Northwest person. Um, so my my little talk is um, I call it if the facts get in the way of my theory, so much the worse for the facts. Okay, or you know, the the the, the vari variation on that is you know. Don't let truth get in the way of a good story, right? Okay, so there's a fair amount of writing out there on the subject of big data, which purports to show why there cannot be competitive problems in data-driven businesses. Um, for example, the argument that data is like sunshine or that all you need is a good idea and a garage to become the next Google. Um, Maurice, Stuckey, and I go through um, 10 of these arguments in our book and point out flaws with each of them, and we call them the 10 myths, okay? So, but what I thought I'd talk about today is a little more big picture, um, and, and I think it's something that lies behind many of these arguments. Um, I grew up in Chicago, a few blocks away from the University of Chicago um, in the 60s and 70s, okay? By the time I finished high school, the law and economics profs down the street were going full tilt. Um, they were successful, as we all know. Um, when Robert Bork received DOJ's John Sherman Award in 2005, his, his acceptance speech was like a winning horse taking a victory lap. All right, Josh Wright and several others here today um, argue for an even bigger role for economics. And I think um, economists everywhere should rejoice because this means more jobs after grad school. Uh, Josh Wright's students are here. Um, so I like working with economists, and um, I always listen to what they have to say. But I, I've come to think that economics should have a, a more humble role um, to play in antitrust. Um, its role should really be to make sure that lawyers and judges um, do not do anything really stupid. Okay. In other words, it should, it should serve as a reality check. When we ask for it to do a lot more than that, we get into trouble. Why do I say this? Well, in the first place, the legal standard never was, nor will it ever be, that the side with the smartest economist or the most elegant model wins. Okay. Second, we should remember that the law and economics critique was really intended to be a corrective. It never aimed, at least to, to my knowledge, and maybe I, I don't know enough about it, but to my knowledge, it never aimed to replace a legal standard with an economic standard. In fact, I think Bork even disclaimed that in the antitrust paradox. 
Um, third, in, at least in my limited experience, economists have somewhat rough tools to play with. I mean, I know it, it sounds impressive, but I think the tools are somewhat rough and the questions are somewhat rough. And when things get complicated, as they do with free services, the tools get more difficult to use and may not even be there. So let me just give you one example of what I think an appropriate role for economics can be and how it's played out in um, a case that involves data. Um, in 2014, DOJ successfully challenged Bizarre Voices' completed acquisition of power reviews. You've probably read or perhaps even wrote an online review for something you bought, perhaps a dishwasher or flannel sheets. And that's what the case was about. Bizarre Voice and Power Reviews repeatedly acknowledged in their business documents how the other was the, its only significant commercial competitor. The internal business documents talked a lot about network effects, including one that said the network effects would be nearly impossible for someone to break. And they also talked about barriers to entry, including one where Bizarre Voice said that its, its ability to leverage the data from its consumer base was a key barrier to entry. The defense argued, in effect, that these documents were meaningless from the standpoint of economics, all right? The, the executives' views were misguided under economic theory. In other words, what they thought they were talking about with things like barrier to entry and network effects, they, were just, they just didn't know what they were talking about. They were using those words, okay? So the defense argument, to quote, you know, to, to, to kind of flag Jeff Manny over there, um, was that hot docs should give way to cold economic reasoning, right? Um, DOJ won the case largely because of the factual record, okay? But in fairness, I have to add, DOJ also had the help of Carl Shapiro. So the government also might have won the case under the standard that the party with the best economists wins. But that wasn't the standard the judge applied. And I think it's a, it's a good case because it shows both using documents and making sure that the economics is consistent with what's in the documents, not just going with pure economic theory that says there's no reason to assume there should be a problem in this market. Okay, Catherine, do you have a response to Alan's comments? So I should first of all disclose I have a PhD in economics. Um, you know, I, I love the idea, what I would say is I love the idea is economics being a corrective. And one reason I love the idea of economics being corrective is, you know, for my sins, I was recently in Brussels. It was before Brexit, so I was still welcome. And, um, and you know, it was remarkable there just how much you s I heard economic terms being thrown around intended to sound impressive without any real weight behind them. So I love the idea of using economics as a corrective. Of course, you might disagree on the degree of correction that's necessary. And I would just kind of echo Alan's comments. I think uh, sometimes we think that antitrust has become this very rational, uh, very straightforward enterprise, especially from the agency perspective. Um, I think oftentimes the quote, non-economic evidence is really what's carrying the day, both for enforcement uh, agency decisions mm -hmm. and from court's perspective. I mean, I think the narrative is, is essential, not just a nice side benefit to looking at quote, non-economic evidence that really is, of course, economic. <laughs> so on the topic of um, applying economics to digital platforms, I'd like John to give his talk about the myth of free so that we make sure we've got time to discuss that as well. All right, well, I'll caveat my remarks by saying I do not have a PhD in uh, economics. So this is gonna be a talk from a legal perspective, by and large, the extent you can avoid acting as an armchair economist these days when talking about these issues. 
I view the idea of big data and competition, um, the idea of dominant platforms, very much from the perspective of free. That's capital F, free. Uh, when we talk about these products, they are mostly, not all, but mostly advertising supported uh, platforms. The products themselves, Google Search, Gmail, YouTube, et cetera, et cetera, are offered to consumers free of charge. We don't pay any fiat currency for using these things. So uh, what we have is big data as sort of derived demand, right? The, the huge thirst that's out there for big data right now is in large part derived demand. We're trying to make our advertisements better, more effective, more persuasive. That's why, uh, in, in large part, firms want big data. So from an antitrust enforcement perspective, what's happened? By and large, we have, we writ large, focused on the advertiser side of these markets. Why? Because that's where the prices are. We're very steeped in neoclassical price theory, so we look for prices. We look for price harm. Uh, the problem there is that the advertising side of these markets is probably really big. I think Catherine's work suggests pretty convincingly that there's a great deal of substitutability even between offline and online advertising. That's a big, big market. Very hard to ever see any competitive harm in such a big market. Uh, I think enforcement agencies have started looking at innovation harm on the user side of these markets, but that's a really tough sell, uh, particularly in M&A analyses. Why? Because what CEO ever went to her board to sell a transaction by saying, hey, after the merger, we're not going to be innovative anymore. It doesn't happen. So the kind of documentary evidence, the hot docs aren't out there. And the econ, I'm not sure, is there either. We don't have a robust model of how innovation works. So uh, what we need to do, I'd suggest, is really fundamentally reconceive the user experience as a transaction. Uh, I come at this from also a doctrinal contract law perspective. Contract law has long recognized that information, attention to advertisements, can serve as consideration to form a legally enforceable contract. These are classical cases from the Farnsworth casebook. Uh, my favorite one, Jennings, a prisoner in Texas, listening to the radio. The radio says, the radio announcer says, we'll pay you 25,000 bucks if we don't play five songs in a row without any advertisements. Lo and behold, the station plays three songs and plays an advertisement. Prisoner's got a lot of time on his hands. Calls in, hey, you didn't do what you said. Uh, response from the radio station, that's not a contract. Court said, yeah, there's consideration here. This user, this listener, is surrendering something of value. This is a transaction. Antitrust, I think, particularly is lagging behind of really fundamentally conceiving of what's going on here as a transaction, a market transaction. So our pizza example, I think, fits right into that, right? This is a transaction. If you get something of value, you'll exchange something of value. So uh, where should we be looking? If we can reconceptualize these experiences as very much transactional on the part of users, consumers, uh, I'll suggest that transactions like Facebook, Instagram, right? Maybe should have raised a few more red flags. If you look at the business commentary, there's pretty unified agreement. Facebook is acquiring a rival, a competitor. Maybe not a big, important competitor from the advertising side. Instagram wasn't even advertising at the time, but a very important competitor from the user side. Uh, Zillow Truly is another one that was recent. If you look at looking for hot docs, interesting quotes, look at investor calls subsequent to the, the clearance of this transactions. You've got the CEO of Zillow saying, we have now rationalized the market, we've consolidated the market. Classic CEO speak for, great, we've got a competitive advantage. Uh, and also talking about things like having a 67, 78% market share. Pretty compelling stuff, just from a qualitative uh, perspective. And this was an acquisition that was cleared without condition. And then finally, Facebook, WhatsApp, in the news very much recently. And uh, the interesting thing, I think, from this, this transactional re reconceptualization perspective is that you've got the EU calling this a case that falls into the gray zone, right, between privacy and antitrust. I'll suggest that there's not really a gray zone. And it's not that these two are in fundamental tension, as others might uh, claim. Really, you can think of antitrust and, quote, privacy law as a Venn diagram. And where data information is being exchanged, transacted, 
you're not in a gray area between the two, you're really in the intersection between the two. Um, so I just have one question, then I want to open it up for Q&A. Um, on the idea of the myth of free, I know I think a lot in doing in analyzing antitrust about the consumer welfare standard and its focus on price instead of other qualitative um, measures. And you know, to what extent, perhaps Alan, you might have a view on this. To what extent is this kind of single-minded focus on price throwing us off course when you're looking at um, competitive problems with digital platforms? Okay. So first, I'm not arguing against the consumer welfare standard. Okay, um, but. The price tools are better developed than the non-price tools, right? That's not a radical um, statement. Um, but you got to go with the tools you have if there's some degree of reliability and if they're appropriate to, to the case. So, um, you know, going to, to Zillow Trulia, um, the FTC didn't, you know, there was a potential loss of privacy and, and loss of privacy competition. That potentially was harm to consumer welfare. Um, but they, they didn't model it out. Okay, so, you know, Keith Ware at Bates White worked with me and did some modeling on how do you, how do you model in a free, free goods context um, a non-price, a quality or privacy dimension. And he, you know, he managed to do you know, he, he's from Caltech, so he probably knows this stuff, I think. But, um, you know, he, he managed to model it. I think, you know, which is, a, it's all good. This is not, say, the FTC, you know, bad FTC, good, whatever. I mean, this is, this all takes learning, and it takes development, and it takes both the lawyers and the economists starting to ask the right questions, find the right tools if they're not out there, use the tools that are appropriate. Um, and, you know, I think that's, that's the bottom line answer. I... Do we have any questions from the audience? Teddy? You mentioned, uh, so I, I guess I don't really understand. So only if the tool is, 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 is available, readily available, are you going to use it? I mean, if you're talking about all these other types of uh, potential harms, you still think it's okay to just focus on price? I just intellectually don't understand no, that no, point. That, no, I, I was actually saying the opposite, which is you, you, you know, the agencies, and, and we talk a, a fair amount about this in the book, the agencies focus a lot more on, the, the agencies focus a lot on price. They give lip service to quality and to non-price dimensions, but when you get down to it, they don't do a lot of cases that are non-price oriented, okay? The first point is there are tools that can be used, you, you know, but, but it's not like CSI. It's, you know, this is not like you got to bring in forensic evidence and if you don't have for forensic evidence, you don't have a case, right? You, you've got to use the tools that you have available and you got to develop, you got to work to develop the new tools. That, that was really the point. Follow-up question is, uh, you know, this 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 idea that um, you know there's a contract between the customer, you know, providing something of value, can maybe talk about how that's just the just not done at the FCC that, or, or, or DOJ. That they, well, they just don't do that. Well, so, so let me can I can I just give my I, I've been wanting to give this example. This is my favorite. This is what really proves that data is currency. Okay, which is when I watched the A team in you know, the 1980s, I never had to do anything in front of my TV set except sit down and watch it, okay? If I want to see a squirrel searching for a nut in a dog's fur and pulling it out on YouTube, okay? Or if I want to see what an ex-girlfriend is up to on Facebook, I have to sign a contract to do that before I'm allowed to do that. And that, that, that is the, the terms of service. And the terms of service say, if you want to do those things, you got to pay me something to do it. You got to give me your access to your data, right? So that's the contractual part. The, the reason it's, I think it's significant is that, like in the DOJ analysis of media mergers, 
you know, the focus, you know, there was, there was other stuff going on that was not on the advertising side, but it was, it was largely ignored, okay? I think it's harder to ignore it when there's a contractual relationship between the user and, and the provider of the service. I also do think it's important to, to emphasize that giving your data is a price. Personally, if I could pay for Google search for the rest of my life, I would choose that over being tracked by Google. But I'm not given that option. But you know, you're paying with your data is is a form of compensation. So I, I think that's an important point to make. And I don't think the antitrust enforcers have really been viewing it through this that lens. All right, I think we're out of time. Could talk all could talk all afternoon. But thank you, thank you so much to these panelists. I really appreciate your insights and gave me a lot to think about. Thank you.